in the U.S. stock market continues. The Dow Jones closing up 212 points right at the high of the day. But it's not just the Dow Jones that is rising. And by the way, this is the highest the Dow has closed since early January. So it's better than a one-month high. Oil prices uh, closing above $33 a barrel for West Texas. Again, that's the highest level since early January. Dollar also weak across the board. In fact, I noticed the Canadian dollar hit a three-month high today against the U.S. dollar. This currency has really been beaten up until recently. So this is not the highest the Canadian has been since early January. But you got to go back three months to see the loonie at this exchange rate. And the chart looks pretty good that this currency is going higher. Gold higher again today. Nothing big, up four or five bucks. I think it closed above 1232. So what is behind the rally? And I think it is the deluge of bad economic news that keeps raining down on this market and including bad earnings from companies and not just multinationals, companies that are predominantly operating in the United States. Uh, These companies are reporting uh, much worse than expected news and their stocks were getting hammered. But overall, the market is now recovering because I believe more and more people are beginning to realize that the Fed is not only not going to be raising interest rates in 2016, but they're going to be cutting them. They're going to be doing another round of economic stimulus, and that is what is saving the market. The question is, will the Fed meet those expectations and actually come out and validate them, or are they going to throw cold water on it, in which case this rally will fizzle out And the market is going to go for new lows. But in fact, even Jim Cramer of CNBC can see there's a recession. I just put an an article on my Facebook page uh, yesterday. Cramer is saying that the Fed is blind and they can't see a recession. That's exactly what I've been saying. Now, maybe Cramer's been listening to my podcast. I don't know. I mean, he might listen. I mean, I, you know, I was on his show. He had a radio show a long, long time ago. And I was on his show. And, of course, he introduced me. It was Peter Schiff, Europe Pacific Capital. There's always a bull market somewhere. That was my tagline. And it was shortly thereafter that that I, he began using the same tagline himself about there's always a bull market somewhere. So if you don't want to know where he got that, I, he got it from me. Now, I can't prove that, but I never saw him using it until after I was on his was radio show or something. And I used it. I mean, I started that tagline back in like 2001 or 2002. I mean, before he started using it on his CNBC program. But in any event, he's been saying the same thing in that, hey, the Fed is blind. I mean, look at how can they say there's no recession? Look at all these signs. And in fact, do you remember the famous uh, interview, which went viral, I think, on YouTube as well? It was Jim Cramer with Aaron Burnett. Remember, she was wearing that giraffe skin print dress and he just went on this rant you know they know nothing they know nothing talking about the fed because he could see everything was imploding and the fed was just acting like it was no big deal and he wanted the fed to help he wanted the fed to come to the rescue like the cavalry riding in to save everybody from the indians and do something right cut rates bail out the markets well he's not ranting and raving he hasn't gotten to that point yet But it's very similar to me. And you got Kramer calling out the Fed for not appreciating the weakness in the economy and calling on them to do something. And I think they are going to do something. They're not just going to, you know, turn a deaf ear uh, to all this. But the Fed is still is still officially sticking to the party line. And that's one of the things I really want to talk about on today's podcast is the interview I watched this morning with Jim Bullard on CNBC. And so here's one of the interesting things about the interview. First, he told the guy interviewing him, he said that what his concern was, what he was worried about, was that inflation expectations were too low. Now, of all the things that you're going to worry about as a central banker, you're going to worry about the fact that people don't expect enough inflation. I mean, historically, that would be a victory, right? That's what you want as a central banker. You want to stamp out the fear of inflation. But what Bullard wants is more fear. 
Right? He wants people to expect even higher inflation than they currently expect. Now, why would he want that? I mean, supposedly that that is the thing that is restraining the economy, that somehow the lack of belief that inflation is going to be higher is somehow holding back the economy, which makes no sense whatsoever. Now, Bullard believes inflation is going to be higher. He's just upset that other people don't believe it, too. But why? I mean, what possible explanation? I mean, how would the anticipation of higher inflation, how would that help an economy, right? If, if, if you thought that prices were going to go up, how would that help you? I mean, it, I can't. I mean, first of all, let's think about it from the point of view of the consumer. If you believe that inflation was going to be higher in the future, how would that affect you? Would it make you happy to know about that? I don't think so, right? If I knew that the cost of living was going to go up, I might want to prepare for that. I might think, oh, so things are going to get more expensive. Okay, well, I better cut back on my spending because I'm going to need that extra money. I better not take that vacation or maybe I shouldn't buy that new television or that new car because my, my food is going to be more expensive. My utilities are going to be more expensive. You know, my rent might go up. I better cut back, right? That's the rationale. You're not going to say, oh, I'm expecting more inflation, so I better hurry up and spend money. Why would you do that? Right? Or think about it from the point of view of a businessman. If I have a business and I expect more inflation, why is that going to make me positive? I mean, if I think my customers are going to have a higher cost of living, why would that make me feel that my business is going to improve? It wouldn't. I don't want my customers to have to spend more money on their rent or on their food or on, on their utility bills. I'd like to see the cost of living go down so that my customers have more money to spend on my products or my services. I mean, the idea that the belief in higher inflation is somehow positive. Now, I suppose if I thought that I could raise my prices, but nobody else could raise theirs, well, then, you know, that might make me feel better. But inflation is not just about one business being able to have pricing power, because if one business have pricing power, they all have pricing power, right? But also, it's not just the prices I charge, but the prices I pay, right? Some people might say, well, inflation is good for business because they can raise their prices. But the price doesn't matter. It's the margin that matters. Because if I'm a business, I have to buy stuff before I sell stuff. I have costs, right? I buy wholesale and sell retail. And so if I have pricing power, my suppliers have pricing power. So they jack up the prices they charge me. I, I raise the prices I charge my customers. And maybe I sell fewer products. So even though there's higher prices, I do less volume and I make less money. And also, what about my workers, right? If I have pricing power, maybe they have pricing power. Maybe they demand higher wages. Now, of course, it depends on their skill set and supply and demand. But look, all this is going to factor in. Inflation is never good for business. The only thing that's good about inflation is if you're a debtor. If you've borrowed money, yes, inflation will help ease the pain of that debt. But if everybody believes, maybe the Fed thinks, gee, if businesses only believed there was more inflation, they would borrow more money. But if lenders believe there's more inflation, they will ask for a higher interest rate to lend that money. So that still doesn't work. Yes, businesses want to borrow more, but lenders don't want to lend. Now they want to charge more. So real interest rates have to go up or nominal rates have to go up. I mean, you would figure the last thing the Fed would want is for people to expect higher inflation because what would happen to bondholders, right? You have all these people that are holding U.S. Treasuries. If they really thought inflation was going to be higher, they wouldn't want to hold them at such low rates. They would be demanding higher payments of interest on those bonds, which would crush the government because they don't have the money. And it would also crush the Fed because the Fed's balance sheet is loaded up with long-term government bonds that yield next to nothing. What's going to happen to the value of those bonds if potential buyers believe inflation is going to be higher? They're not going to want those bonds not at those yields, so the bond prices are going to collapse and the Fed's going to take a huge hit. So it makes no sense at all that the Fed or anyone on the Fed would be worried that inflation expectations aren't high enough. They should be relieved that people aren't smart enough to expect higher inflation because that's what they're going to get. You know, all the people out there that don't expect inflation, they're going to be surprised. And by the time they figure out how much inflation is coming, of course, it's gonna, they're, they're going to have some huge losses. But that is going to be you know, one of the best examples of be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Because when the bondholders wake up and realize just how much inflation they're going to get relative to what they expect, 
that is a nightmare scenario again for the Fed. Now, also, here's another thing that Bullard said in this interview. He acknowledged that the GDP growth for last year was disappointing, right? 1.8% was the growth. And who knows, it might be a little less than that. We're getting the revision to the fourth quarter tomorrow. They initially reported it as up 07 And so we'll see how much lower they, they make that. It's going to be interesting to see if it's still a positive number. We'll find out on Friday. I'm probably not going to do a, a podcast Friday, though, but I'll try to do one over the weekend. I'm actually going to be traveling uh, on Friday and be down in Miami for a conference for the day. So I might record something on Saturday to address the GDP. But in any event, it was 1.8% last year. And Bullard said that that wasn't that good, but that this year it's going to be a lot better. And he was forecasting about 2.5% growth for 2016. And then he said, but, you know, that's not great. That's, you know, nothing to write home about. It's, it's, it's still less than our potential, and we'd like to see more, but at least it's going to be a better year than last year. Now, what I would have loved to have seen is a follow-up question. And that question would be, what makes you think that? I mean, what is your evidence? I mean, think about that. What evidence is there that 2016 is going to be so much better than 2015? I mean, all the evidence would suggest the exact opposite of that, right? I mean, think about where we were in February of 2015. I mean, the fourth quarter GDP, the last quarter of 2014, was 2.5%. So we came into the 20, 20, 2015 with a 2.5% Q4 in the previous year. So things looked okay. We're starting 2016 where the last quarter was just 0.7. So why would you be so much more optimistic about 2016 given where we're starting relative to where we started 2015? But of course, it's much worse. I mean, the stock market is collapsing or at least, you know, now it's rallying back somewhat, but it's still way down. And look at the financial conditions. Look at the, the spreads on junk bonds. Look at the carnage in the, the, the banks. Look at what's happening with earnings. Look at how many stocks have been obliterated. Look at how many stocks are down 50% or more in the last few months. I mean, that wasn't happening in early 2015. Look at the economic data. Look at the uh, service PMI I mentioned yesterday in contraction below 50, you know, for the first time since the Great Recession, if you don't count the government shutdown. But look at all the ISM and industrial production numbers. And I mean, all the numbers are awful. I mean, we've probably haven't gotten off to a worse start in a year in any year. I mean, we're probably we're off to a worse start for 2016 than we were for 2008. And we all know how that ended up, right? That was a complete disaster. This year is getting off to a worse start than that year. Also, interest rates were at zero for the entirety of 2015. So the economy and the markets had that you know, tailwind of zero percent interest rates. Now we've had a rate hike and we're facing the potential of three or four more hikes during the course of the year. So instead of having the tailwind, we have the headwind. So if the economy only grew at 1.8% last year and it didn't have any of these problems at the beginning of the year that we have now with the markets, you know, with the bond markets, with the stock markets, with the economy imploding, with all the problems with the retailers, right? And now in addition to that, we have higher interest rates which we didn't have last year, how is it possible that anybody thinking rationally can at this point in February proclaim that 2016 is going to be a much better year for the economy than 2015? How could you do that based on what evidence? I mean, is the unemployment rate lower? Yes, the unemployment rate is lower, right? But so is labor force participation. That's way lower. And in fact, full-time employment is down. It's part-time employment that's up. So, I mean, are we really in a better position jobs-wise? I don't think so. Plus, look at all the announced layoffs uh, that are building. The weekly unemployment claims, even though they're still low, they're now trending up. So that, that trend is turning. So I think that given where we were a year ago, we're much more likely to see an increase in unemployment in 20. 16 than we saw in 2015. So if that's the case too, why would you expect that the economy is going to grow faster uh, in, in this year? And not just a little bit faster, but considerably faster than it did last year when we didn't have any of these headwinds.
The answer has got to be, there's no way. It's impossible. Bullard can't be that dumb. He can't possibly actually believe this. So again, it's got to be open mouth operations. It's got to be a desperate attempt to talk the economy up, field of dream style. Like if we build it, it will come, right? If we talk enough about this recovery, then we'll actually have one. They are trying to mold expectations because remember, they're all team players. Just like Ben Bernanke said, when he was talking in 2005 and 2006, he wasn't giving an honest assessment because he was a member of the administration. He was towing the party line. What is the Obama line? The economy is great because I inherited a disaster from the Republicans and I fixed everything and now we have a great economy. And he wants his minions at the FOMC to basically carry that water for him. Sell that to the public. Sell that to the voters. It's a great economy. It's a great economy. But at some point, they're going to have to change their tune. The question is, what are they going to blame it on? Right? They're not going to accept responsibility. They're not going to say it's because of anything that we did wrong, even though it's because of everything they did wrong. But they'll try to blame it on something going on in another country. And finally, too, when he was asked, point blank, about the rate hikes, Bullard, how many hikes are we going to get? What do you think is going to happen with the rate hikes? And before he was like, yeah, we're going to get four rate hikes. So he was asked, what's going to happen? And he basically dodged the question. And he was said something like, well, Leo, you know, let's not worry about how many hikes, right? It's not about the number. He said, let's just be data dependent. So there he is, data dependent, hedging his bets once again. Look, if you think the economy is going to grow 2.5%, during the year, then why wouldn't you say, yeah, we're going to raise rates three or four times? If you really believe that the economy is going to grow two and a half percent a year, the fact that he didn't say that suggests that he doesn't believe it. And of course, how could he believe it? He can't possibly be so dumb that he would actually believe that given all the information that has already come out. Right? Nobody would come to that conclusion. And so he's hedging his bets now. He's already talking about the data. And look, the Fed raised interest rates last year even though they were data dependent, even though the data was lousy. So the data had nothing to do with the rate hike. It was the calendar. The year was almost over and they still hadn't raised rates and they were afraid if they didn't do it, the cat would be out of the bag. People would realize how weak the economy was. So out of desperation, out of this Hail Mary, they raised rates to show how confident they were in this economy, which really, you know, they should have had no confidence in. And in fact, that's why they waited so long because they had no confidence. And they were so afraid that if they didn't raise rates, they would, their lack of confidence would be confirmed or revealed. So they raised rates and they hoped for the best. And of course, they got the worst. And so now they're backpedaling again and they're falling back on this data dependent. So the minute you know that they're saying data dependent, it means they're not, they're not hiking rates because they're not data dependent. Data has not, that's their excuse so they can avoid raising rates because imagine how much more damage they would do to the economy if they raise rates again. I mean, the markets could barely stand what's already been done. And as I just said, the reason for this rally is based on the growing expectation that the Fed is not going to be raising rates in March or June or probably any time this year. But again, I still don't even think that that's enough. I still think that where we are is going to require a rate cut but again, you don't get much bang for the buck going from where we are to zero. And even if they go negative, I mean, how negative can they go? The only thing they've got is QE. And even that might not work. Of course, it never actually worked. But it may not even deliver the same type of artificial high that we got before. And I think that if they do another round of QE, as I said before, politically in election year, they can't just do something that's going to be perceived as a bailout for Wall Street. They're going to have to do a mainstream QE, which is going to be a government spending tax cut helicopter drop type Keynesian stimulus that everybody is going to be uh, in favor of and every no one is going to want to oppose it in an election year. And again, also, I don't know how much longer the Fed can hold off because the longer they wait, the closer to the election, the you know economy is going to blow up or the recession is going to emerge in a way that they can't deny it. And the way it's looking, if you know Donald Trump's going to be the nominee, Donald Trump is a shoe in to beat Hillary Clinton if we are in an official recession in November, right? Because Hillary's only chance is four more years, right? And even though these years have been bad, there has to be the perception that we're going to continue the supposed progress that we've enjoyed under Obama. 
But if everything is collapsed and that whole narrative of I inherited a mess and cleaned it up, if that's replaced by I inherited a mess and made a bigger mess, then Hillary can't win. And Donald Trump will. And Donald Trump will be the only guy that if you want change, you don't vote for Hillary Clinton. Now, she's not change. I mean, Hillary was the first lady. She was a senator. She was secretary of state. I mean, she's all Washington. She's there's no change there. I mean, yes, yeah, she's a woman. But I mean, that's not that's that's nothing. I mean, you know, that the only change that we had with Barack Obama was that he was black or he was half black. But nothing changed. It just got worse. And so nothing's going to change. Uh, by by having Hillary as the president versus the first lady, because it's the same old, same old. If people want to vote for change, the only candidate that can actually sell change is is um, Donald Trump. And I actually think Donald Trump will get a lot of Bernie Sanders voters. He'll get a lot of crossover voters because a lot of Bernie Sanders voters, they don't even care. They're not even necessarily voting because they believe in socialism. They just want to throw a monkey wrench into the political machine. They just want to do something that they perceive the establishment doesn't want. They want something different. They just want to send Bernie in there to screw things up and to be disruptive and to do something different because even if even if they don't even know what it is or approve of it, at least it's not the same. People know that what we've been doing doesn't work. So let's try anything. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of the Sanders voters say, well, I'm not going to vote for Hillary, so I'll just vote for Trump because he's promising a bunch of something for nothing, too. He's promising that to bring back jobs and not raise my taxes and increase government programs. I mean, he's promising uh, to take care of our vets. I mean, I never heard Trump make a speech where he didn't promise to take care of our vets. What does that mean? Spend more money on vets to get their votes. He's promising, uh, you know, to you know, build all these walls, not going to cost anything, right? We're going we're gonna to somehow impose tariffs that China's going to pay for it, Mexico's going to pay for it. He's going to build up our military, spend more money on the military. You know, he's promising to replace Obamacare with who knows what. I mean, he's talking about all kinds of things. He says, I want to save Social Security, no cuts to Social Security. So he's promising a lot of things that maybe Bernie Sanders voters can get on board with. So if the Federal Reserve doesn't want to just hand this election to Trump on a silver platter, they are going to have to do something. There's a lot of pressure building on the Fed from the Obama administration and probably from Wall Street to do something. Final thing I want to talk about, as long as I'm on the topic of Bernie Sanders, I read this article and I posted it up on my Facebook page. If you haven't seen it, it's got a lot of got a lot of reaches so far, 115,000 or so. But it was based on an article in which this economist is claiming that if Sanders is president, I mean, we're going to have this huge boom. I mean, it's going to be an economic boom. We're going to have a huge increase in the GDP. Real incomes are going up. Real wages are going up. And this guy is saying, if we just elect Sanders and, and, and do his plan, right, not just elect him, but we implement all the things that he's promising, it's going to be like a huge economic boom. Everybody's going to benefit. It's going to be massive economic growth. Unemployment is going to plunge. Incomes are going to surge. Productivity is going to go up. All this stuff is going to happen. Complete and utter, unadulterated, liberal nonsense. And, you know, one of the funniest parts of the article is the reason that the economy is going to do so well is because the, the, the economist that wrote it, he writes that Sanders is going to juice GDP and productivity by pouring $1.5 trillion into the economy. Like the economy is a big pot and Bernie Sanders is going to come along with a pitcher. And he's just going to pour Fourteen and a half trillion dollars in there and stir it up, right? And so now the economy is going to have this extra fourteen and a half trillion dollars, and so that's going to really juice it up. We're going to have all this extra productivity and all this extra GDP. Yeah, I mean, this the guy that wrote this article ever thought about where is Bernie Sanders going to get the fourteen and a half trillion dollars? I mean, Bernie Sanders doesn't have it. I mean, he what is he? He barely has any underwear. Although out of that that was a joke from Saturday Night Live, right? He had you know. Two or three pairs of underwear, or one pair of underwear. But Bernie Sanders doesn't have much money. I mean, even Donald Trump doesn't have that kind of money. I mean, pro Donald Trump could pour a couple of billion into the economy. I guess he can empty out his <laughs> all of his accounts. Although even he can't pour it into the economy because it's already in the economy. And that is my point. Bernie Sanders doesn't have a magic pitcher full of fourteen and a half trillion that he could just pour into the economy. I mean, can the Fed print $14.5 trillion and, and, and pour it into the economy? Sure. But is that going to make the economy grow? No. It's just going to make prices go up. I mean, if you could grow the economy by printing money and stirring it on into the pot, everybody would do that.
And it would be so simple to have real economic growth, but it doesn't work that way. But Bernie Sanders can't do anything. I mean, where is this $14.5 trillion that he's pouring in? Where's it coming from? Where's he going to get it? Now, the art, the guy that wrote the article says, well, he's going to get it because we're going to increase minimum wages. We're going to have all these, um, uh, these programs. We're going to create jobs and put people to work. And all that's additional money. But no, no, it's not. I mean, first of all, if an employer is going to pay his workers more, then he's going to earn less himself. Or if it's a public company, the shareholders are going to, are going to, are going to earn less. There's nothing being poured in anywhere. It's just being transferred. You see, before the government could pour $14.5 trillion into the economy, it first has to siphon out the $14.5 trillion. And in fact, it's got to siphon out more than $14.5 trillion because you have this deadweight loss. Because, you know, the government is just taking money away from one part of the economy and then putting it into another part of the economy. But it doesn't work for free. Government is very expensive and very inefficient. You now, my father's line they told me to describe it. This is government aid, which is what this is, right? Government transfer payments. It's like trying to give yourself a blood transfusion from your left arm to your right arm, only you spill half the blood on the floor in the process, right? So you, you lose blood. And so this is what Bernie Sanders wants to do. He wants to give the economy a transfusion. He wants to take $14.5 trillion out of, out of one part of the economy and put it someplace else. He's not pouring anything in because he's only pouring in what he siphoned out. But you got to pay for all the government in the process, so it's a deadweight loss. But it's more than that, because you got to look at where the money is being pulled out and where it's being pushed in. Because all the taxes, all the higher taxes that Bernie Sanders wants are on investment income, right? If you're going to tax the upper income, you're not really taxing what they spend. You're taxing the money that they were going to save and invest. And so you're leaving less money available to save and invest in the private sector. And the money that's being doled out is more, more or less just going to be consumed. More transfer payments or higher wages that are just going to be spent, right? They're not going to be invested. They're not going to be saved. So you're converting resources that would have been used to support investment and real economic growth and higher labor productivity and more economic output. And you're diverting those resources to pure consumption. So that is going to lower our future standard of living, not diminish it. So by taking money out of the private sector where it would have been invested productively and just diverting it through the government sector to be spent frivolously, that's going to lower our, our economic output, our GDP, ultimately lower our employment. But also, what about the incentives when you ratchet up taxes? I mean, if you look at all the tax increases that Bernie Sanders has, the marginal tax rate, because he wants to eliminate the cap on Social Security. So, you know, you have to pay that 15% on all your money. He wants to raise the income tax. And so if you take a higher income tax and a payroll tax, and, you know, you're talking about 70 plus percent marginal tax rates. Now, what is that going to do to our biggest earners? That's going to create a powerful disincentive to retire early, to not work as hard, because you're not going to receive as much of a reward for your labor, but also... The higher the income tax, the more valuable leisure, leisure becomes, right? I mean, think about that. If the government's going to take 70% of your income, they're basically subsidizing 70% of your vacation. Because if I decide to take a vacation instead of working and my income goes down, I don't lose the 100 cents. I only lose the 30 cents. So it makes it cheaper and cheaper for me to take a vacation instead of work, right? If, if I was in the 99% tax bracket, why work? I mean, I'm only going to get one, one penny on the dollar. I might as well take a vacation because how much do I have to lose? I just lose a penny. The government would lose the 99 cents if I took a vacation. So the higher you make the income tax, the greater the incentive it is for people not to work, to just relax because they don't lose very much. Right. If there's no income tax at all and you take a vacation, well, you lose whatever you, 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 you would have earned. You've lost it. So the government is going to create more and more incentives for people who are working not to work as hard. And of course, by just doling out all sorts of money in government programs, you create another incentive for people just to sign up for those programs and to restructure their lives to qualify for these programs. And if that means they work less, so they have lower income, so they get more money from the government, that's exactly what they do. So the incentives when you do this kind of government redistribution, lowers real economic growth, lowers productivity, lowers living standards, lowers employment. So it's the opposite of what this idiot expects. 
by having massive tax hikes on one segment of the population and then pouring those tax revenues into another part of the economy. He is not pouring anything in. He is not juicing anything. He is destroying. He is liquefying. He, he, he is, this is going to implode the economy. All this is is socialism. And where has it worked? Right? This is another example. Central bankers will never admit that their monetary policy doesn't work. Well, socialists will never admit that their economic policy doesn't work. No matter how many times it's failed, they never admit it. It's, oh, well, it wasn't done right. right? I mean, look at East Germany and West Germany. I mean, it wasn't like you had everybody in West Germany trying to get over the wall to get to East Germany. It was the other way around. I mean, the standard of living in West Germany was about the highest in the world. East Germany was a basket case. Look at North Korea, South Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam. Look at Taiwan and mainland China or Hong Kong and mainland China before mainland China abandoned socialism and embraced the capitalism that was working so well in Hong Kong and Taiwan. I mean, anywhere. Look at, look at Cuba. I mean, there is no example of this working. And in fact, in any capitalist country, as you introduce socialist ideas and socialist programs, you undermine the economic growth. So you could take a look at all the economies in the world and say, OK, which economies are the freest? Which economies have the lowest taxes, the fewest regulations? And you'll see those are the economies that have had the most economic growth. Those are the economies that have the highest per capita incomes. Those are the economies that have the lowest rates of unemployment. So the more you basically encumber a free market with socialist programs and see Bernie Sanders was say, look, I'm not a total socialist. I'm this democratic socialist. I just want to do more stuff like Social Security and Medicare and Obamacare. I just want to expand all that good stuff. That is the stuff that is destroying our economy. Yes, that is socialist stuff. And it doesn't work. See, Bernie Sanders likes to say, well, you, everybody loves Social Security, so you'll love all the other socialist ideas that I have. Well, you know, pe a lot of people don't love Social Security. It's just that the people who are on it, they want their money. But I bet if you can go back in time and tell a lot of people, hey, you know, what about if we can eliminate the Social Security tax so you can keep all that money and invest it the way you want? Uh, would you like to do that? And I bet a lot of people that are getting Social Security now or about to get it would say, yeah, I want to do that. It's just that so many people want Social Security because they've already paid into or they think they've paid in for the last 20 or 30 years. And now they want to get what they've been promised. So what they want is the money they've been promised. I don't think they like the program. They just want their money and they want to make sure that politicians don't cut it. But I think a lot of people understand that the program's a lousy deal. And in fact, a lot of young people who are in their 20s and their 30s, if you said, hey, we'll let, we'll let you out of this deal. Hey, will you, will you sign a deal right now that says, you know, you'll have no Social Security taxes. Your employer won't have any Social Security taxes. You just sign off on your benefits. And I bet the vast majority of people in their 20s and 30s would take that deal in a heartbeat. I mean, I'd take that deal now. I'm 53. If the government came to me and said, hey, we'll stop all your Social Security taxes now, now, in exchange for giving up all your benefits, I'd give them up, even though I've been paying in for, what, 30 years? I still think I can, I can do a better job investing my own money for the next 10 or 15 years and give up all of those promises. So those programs don't work. They've never worked. They're a disaster. And the programs that Bernie Sanders is promising are going to be or would be an even bigger disaster. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks to truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. 
The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.